The quest to perfect my animal room continues. While I knew it would improve aesthetics, I didn't think it would cause an animal to emerge from a year in hiding. I also stirred up a commotion while creating cool features from recycled materials that caught the attention of hungry mouths who demanded food. Although I made steps in the right direction, I made a huge mistake that set me back. This journey began in an area that's essential for what I do, the quarantine room. Here I propagate plants, store materials like food, and house animals before or after being in the display area. Think of it as an unseen organ that helps sustain everything behind the scenes. Maybe that's a weird analogy, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Anyway, the animal room is currently undergoing a huge transformation to increase the viability of the layout. In other words, I want to house as many enclosures as possible while ensuring it all remains manageable. I've been very deliberate about that lately, and here's an area where I've made such improvements. However, as this takes shape, things had to change here. All these tanks are occupied by things you haven't seen yet, so I'll keep them hidden to avoid spoiling upcoming projects. However, I'm about to add well over a dozen new setups for old and new animals in the main room, and some will need to live here while I build those. Luckily, I set this up to be easily adjusted depending on what I'm doing. I used this saltwater tank for a season, but I needed the rocks for a different setup and more space, so removing it was a win-win. Slowly collecting materials over the almost three decades I've done this has left me with quite a stockpile to pull from. Or maybe I should say stockpiles, because they're scattered all around my house as I try to find some semblance of being organized, but I digress. I hate to see stuff go to waste when I know it can be used again and again with a little creativity. I got this pressure washer about two years ago, but I wish I had sooner. It makes it so much easier to reset hardscape from old projects to give them a second life and beyond. I think that's pretty cool. Now I don't have a photographic memory or anything like that, but it's wild because I can remember where most of these have been. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, they can rest in the scape dojo until they live another life. That'll probably happen sooner rather than later as new designs emerge. The same is true for those other tanks. Sometimes I can just clean them, while others are broken down to become part of something else. It creates a loop where little goes to waste and I can save money. If I think about it, that's probably how I developed many of the skills to do this stuff. I had to get creative and discover ways to use hand-me-downs I found on Craigslist or in people's trash. These shelves can hold up to 6 10-gallon tanks, but I only had 3 viable ones in the graveyard. The beauty of this area is that it's air-powered, and behind this door is the source of it all, a linear piston air pump. Just like the internet, it's connected to a series of tubes to create an air loop above the drop ceiling. I can tap into this with airline valves and power as many aquariums as I want with sponge filters. They're one of my favorites and truthfully I'd probably use them more if they weren't so jarring to look at. Now I did have two other tanks, but both were drilled and one was cracked. Personally, I'd rather just fix them than buy new ones. After all, the process is pretty straightforward, especially with these small aquariums, it just takes a little finesse. You just have to cut through the silicone to remove the top frame. Apparently, I didn't actually have enough finesse because I broke a piece as I did, but fixing it at this point was simple. I cut through the seams to remove the damaged panes. I also removed all of the old silicone and cleaned the glass. I have viable offcuts everywhere that I keep for stuff just like this. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, cutting glass is an invaluable skill to learn if you want to DIY this stuff. Sure, there's a learning curve, but with practice, it will become second nature in no time. I can't say the same for applying silicone. I haven't made any improvements since I first tried. It just seems like no matter what I do, I can't get crispy lines. I know all I have to do is count to 10, close an eye, and put my shoes on the opposite feet, and then it will turn out alright. I must be doing something wrong, because even when I do, they look sloppy. Or so I've been told. 
Maybe it's a good thing these will be hidden in the quarantine room. <laughs> you might not think I like lids because of my display tanks, but I actually prefer them, and there's nothing better than polycarbonate. And I think you know where I'm going, but of course I have plenty of scraps of that too. Between me and you, there's just something about glass lids that I've never liked. Maybe it's because they're fragile and prone to slam shut. These minimize evaporation, are basically unbreakable, easy to process, and more. I like to add these feeding holes that are the same size as a deli cup. I also figured why not clean the floor mat while I still had the pressure washer hooked up. I kind of want to get things all cleaned up before the winter anyway. I also decided to continue the renovation out in the room. I'm not really a matchy match type person, but I think uniformity in this space makes the most sense for the long term vision, and there's not much cohesion between the old stands. However, what bothers me more is how they're designed. I tried to fit as many tanks as possible on them, often leading to poor access or a bad view. I still want to maximize the space, but within a practical framework. Now a rack may hold two tanks instead of three, which I'm completely fine with. Making things right, or at least better than I used to, means extra steps, like planing the boards. 2x4s aren't really known for their consistency, yet they're cheap and strong enough to hold heavy enclosures. Plus, I'm not trying to create fine furniture here, just decent looking stands. And you better believe that I dismantle and reuse the materials from the old ones when I replace them. Plus, they're already finished, which would save time later. What doesn't save time is notching the posts, yet I wish I had implemented this years earlier. I was always just trying to work as fast as possible. Drilling straight through the boards and smearing putty in the holes was quicker. This brings up a predicament that I often have with myself. When is good enough good enough? What I mean is that constantly learning and developing new skills ensure I never complete anything faster than before. Sure, I'll master 5 old techniques, but 3 new ones slow the pace, or I get lost in the details and become a perfectionist. I suppose trying new things allows the process to remain fresh and keep me humble. I feel the same way about sanding. I know I can get a better finish if I take the extra time, and sometimes I do. That said, good enough is probably good enough for these. Taking the time to route the sides makes a huge difference though. It allows me to use less material, save space, and looks better. Yet I wasn't paying close enough attention and made an error. I accidentally routed the front. The doors would hide this spot, but I had to fix it. I sifted through my offcuts to find the right pieces, glued them in, and cleaned things up. A reason the old stands didn't match is that I used several different stains. I wanted to do what I can now to ensure that doesn't happen again, so you better believe I stocked up. After applying the poly and cutting the plywood for the sides and doors, I was nearly in the home stretch when a side quest presented itself. I never cared for how few shelves were in the quarantine room cabinets. I really didn't want to buy more, and I've wanted to make some for a while. As you'd expect by now, there were scraps for those too. They may not have been the nicest boards around, but that's okay, you'll really only see the veneered edge. I was able to get them looking half decent with a little love though. I built many of my aquariums from glass shelves I got at Ikea. Those shelves came with some pegs that finally got some use. You may not think an additional shelf in each cabinet would make much difference, but it really did. Having all of the food easily accessible like this dramatically streamlines the feeding process. When I set up this tank a year ago, I added a banjo catfish and I hadn't seen it since. That was until I put it on this new stand. I'd occasionally see tracks in the sand and know they're occlusive, so I wasn't stressed about it. I'm unsure what got into him since, because now he's usually buried in the sand front and center. Kind of unrelated, but a fridge has also been a lifesaver because a lot of the food has to be kept cold. 
It's so rewarding to see how Walnut's personality has developed since going into his Cypress tank. He's an absolute character, especially at night when he knows it's feeding time. The second he hears the cabinets, he's immediately at the front trying to get my attention. On today's menu is a worm. Now I can only speculate why he does this, but without fail, he always collects his spoils and retreats to the back. I was about to put the worms away when I realized Pancake and Flapjack were also asking for some food. I would move his tank soon, but I still had to finish the stands. It's always great to see a vision unfold, and I was so happy with how these were turning out. A feature that I'll never compromise on moving forward are leveling feet or something similar. Anyone who keeps aquariums knows that water on the floor is inevitable. Having space underneath is great insurance, and it makes leveling the stands extremely easy. I've also been enjoying a design with minimal features or hardware. It truly does help the tanks be a focal point. I have a few other features to add to these, but I can't do that until the tanks are in place. I think they look fantastic, and seeing them with the racks I already built is pretty inspiring. I knew they'd look even better with tanks on them. However, the only old one that's going here is walnuts. Everything else will be completely new. Then it came time for the move, and naturally I was stuck doing this on my own. Moving a 75 really is no big deal, but a 75 full of materials, well that's a different story. I knew I'd have to remove everything to do this safely. That took a lot longer than expected, and I was so excited to finally get it moved, but when I did, something went really wrong. I'm very disappointed right now. I just got this tank moved over here, and as you can see the gap in between here, it's pretty small. can hardly fit my arm through which is not ideal for maintenance, and the whole point of doing all of this was to make things more accessible, easier to manage, etc. Now, I can still use the rack because I was going to put a front opening 75 on here. I can't put it up top because this is actually shorter than this is down here because that originally it was going to go up top. So I will put that on the bottom and then I'll have to make some type of other tank to fit on the top here, but it's discouraging because I made this whole thing for this tank specifically so now I got to build a completely new rack whereas I was trying to consolidate the collection a little bit and uh, it just complicates things right and I don't know if I don't know I'm not sure exactly what happened my calculations or measurements or something were <laughs> way off somewhere along the way and this happened so Long story short, spent two hours doing this. Now I gotta put it back. I feel bad because Walnut's out of his tank, obviously, and I don't really like to stress the animals out or anything like that. So gotta get this moved back and figure out what the heck went wrong. I tried not to let this get the best of me because I didn't want to worsen matters. Thankfully, I got everything back safely, but I couldn't help but feel like I let Walnut down. Hopefully the next time I have to move it will be the last. I kept thinking to myself, how did this happen? I was so meticulous during planning. However, it didn't take me long to discover the answer. I realized that the dimension for my tank was wrong on the blueprint, which skewed the entire thing. Needless to say, I'll be adding this and routing the wrong surface to my building checklist from now on. Despite the mishap and my disappointment, I still feel very hopeful about it all. You may wonder, why am I going through all the trouble to do this? At that moment, I was too. Then I considered what I'm working toward, and remembered how self-improvements often begin with growing pains. On the surface, it might just seem like a renovation, and it is, but it's much more than that. I've been making deliberate changes to have a better work-life balance, and fully enjoy what I'm doing here. I've spoke about that before, and will in the future when I get myself sorted out. It might not make sense why this plays a role, but it's a critical component. For now, I'll explain it like this. I've been able to enjoy the setups I moved more in the past month than I have in a long time because of the improved view. Even though I'm always passionate about this stuff, it reminded me why I do what I do. Something as silly as feeding the banjo catfish or walnut gleefully swimming encourages me to see this through. 
That makes me think. Even though it's not perfect yet, it's fine. Good enough? Yeah, good enough is good enough.